I don't mind giving this. I can give this talk a thousand times. I think I have given it a thousand times. And I still want to. All right, we got our volume as well. At the end, I've got some videos. Cool. How many of you are like, have you ever had somebody come up to you and be like, you're a Christian? Uh huh. What about dinosaurs? Anybody ever had that? A little bit? I, I, so here's the thing. If you haven't had that question, I'm going to, I don't want you to, I just want you to think about it. How often do you spend with unbelievers out in the streets, maybe? Or, or just inviting unbelievers to your house for dinner or something like that? Because see, <coughs> it's very, very easy for us. And, and I'm preaching to myself. Can I preach to myself for a second? You can listen in. It's really, really easy to, um, to get to the point where, like, everybody you know is Christian. And, like, speaking Christianese becomes a very simple thing because everybody understands your Christianese. Um, that's really easy. And, it, and, it, and it's actually very easy to get into that, that trap. And you didn't even know you were in that trap because all your friends are Christians. But how effective can you be if all your friends are Christians in bringing new people into the kingdom? So I'd commit to you, put yourself out there. We, we do street training, especially with youth. And we go to churches and we teach them how to evangelize. And evangelism is just a conversation. That's the, the one thing that, that I learned years ago that helped me out tremendously was it's not my job to save anybody. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. My job is to go have a conversation. And, and Greg Kokel from uh, Stand to Reason Ministries, he's got a couple of things. We use the Columbo tactic, but... But one of the things that he says is, look, all we're trying to do when we go out into the streets, and when I say the streets, how many of you know that's your workplace or the grocery store or the hardware store or the restaurant with your waitress? That's what I say when I hit, say hit the streets. I mean, outside of the walls of the church, all you're trying to do is put a pebble in their shoe. How uncomfortable is it when you get a little, I mean, I can get the tiniest grain of sand in my shoe and I'm stopping what I'm doing and I'm get, I had to do that all week long at camp because there's so much sand and rocks and gravel and stuff. I kept having to take my shoe off and get, I can't stand when something gets in my shoe. It's uncomfortable. And so what our goal is when we teach evangelism, we teach that when we go out into restaurants or grocery stores or anywhere like that is, man, all you're trying to do is put a pebble in their shoe. That's all. If, if you account, sometimes, uh, and, and, and I'll tell you a quick story and then we'll move on. At what, what time are we finished? Noon? Okay. Um, there was this one time, so in doing what I do, I don't see, I don't, I don't get the chance to pray with a lot of uh, people because one, I, I, don't, I don't like altar calls at youth events sometimes because I don't want to create some emotional experience that they're going to miss the actual calling of the Holy Spirit because a lot of the times they're just so full of emotion because they sang a song and then Betty gets up and she's going, well, then Susie has to go because Betty went and then Carol's got to go because Susie and Betty went. Carol has no idea why she's going to the altar, but she thinks she got saved because she walks a mile. Five years later, Carol's questioning whether or not she's anything because she never meant it in the first place. And I see that all too often. I don't want to, I don't want to get in the way of the Holy Spirit. So I don't really offer an altar call a lot. I do, I do always try and share the gospel and make sure that they have an opportunity to clearly hear the gospel. So God rewards me sometimes because there was one day where it was just pouring down rain and we have the trash service and on the top of it it says bag trash only. Well, Shannon, this guy who was living with us, he put a bunch of nail-ridden two-by-fours just sticking out of the top of this thing. My son, who's supposed to take the trash out at the time, he didn't take the trash out. And I hear the trash truck coming down the road and I know my wife is going to just yell if we don't get this nail-ridden two-by-four trash can emptied so that we can put our bag trash in there. So in the pouring rain, I go out there and I take the trash can and I push it towards the front of the driveway and I'm like, oh, I can see the trucks coming and they're just going to yell at me. And so I, I go back and I'm trying to like scooch real quick to get out of the way so maybe I don't get yelled at. And all of a sudden I go, hey! And I'm like, ah, oh, here we go again. And at the time, I worked for a company called Christian Roofing and Remodeling, and my van was in the driveway with Christian Roofing and Remodeling on the side of it. And so the guy comes up to me, and I thought he was about to yell at me about the two-by-fours. And all of a sudden, he goes, Christian Roofing and Remodeling, does that mean you're a Christian? And I said, well, actually, yeah, I, 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 it's not the business, but yes, I am. He goes, How's that working out for you? Well, in the pouring down rain, let me tell you how that's working out for me. So I was able to give him about a 30-second snippet of what it means to be a Christian, and he's crying just in tears. And I say, man, do you want that right now? And he says, please help me. 
And so I led the, the sinner's prayer. And right there in my driveway, this stranger that I've never met before, I'm praying with him to receive Christ. So you never know when that moment's going to come where you get to see that. As a pastor, I saw it more because I was local and I was pastoring. But I'm over the road so much. My, my job is to plant and water and I just trust that God's going to make it grow when I leave. So all of you kids who are at Camp Fairwood, then you have to grow or else you failed. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Gosh, y'all are so like dried up this morning. You can laugh at that. I said you failed and you're like, oh, did he just insult me? No. Anyways, long story short, I can <laughs> you want to talk about dinosaurs in the Bible? Okay, for the three of you, we're going to do that. The rest of you can drink coffee or something. So let me ask you a question. How many of you know if the Bible mentions dinosaurs? Where at? Job, that's right. You guys are smart. Uh, there's a lot of people who have no clue this is in their Bible, and I love telling them, it's like, look, you know that dusty thing that's over in the corner because you never pick it up? If you pick it up and actually read it, you're going to run into this. Look at the behemoth which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like an ox. Now that word behemoth or leviathan is often capitalized, and it means a mighty animal described as an example of the power of God. It's also something of monstrous size, power, and appearance. I mean, whatever this, but, but what, what is the key takeaway here? Which I made along with you. When would that have been made? On day six. This wasn't like dinosaurs were extinct 65 million years ago. God's telling you, look, I made it alongside of you. Go on to Job chapter 41 and it gets even better. I will not fail to speak of Leviathan's limbs, its strength and its graceful form. Who can strip off its outer coat? Now, the new, anybody got an NIV in here? Okay, in your book, because I read the NIV first when I first got saved, I read it for years. I've switched to the ESV, but I still like the NIV because I memorized so much scripture that way. Because in the footnotes, it says this might be describing a hippo. <laughs> I have no clue who writes these footnotes, but bless their heart. That's just wonderful. <laughs> it, can't, it can't be an alligator or a crocodile either, because if any of you have ever been to Florida, because apparently in Wisconsin, y'all don't have gator boots out here, but. But yeah, I have gator boots. All the youth were like, we got Crocs. <laughs> I was like, that's not what I'm talking about. Gator boots. Down south, gator boots is a big deal. Gator tails, like a delicacy. Who can strip off its outer coat? Who can penetrate its double coat of armor? And, and that, so that can't be talking about an alligator because I can buy you some alligator boots down in Florida. Who dares open the doors of its mouth, ringed about with fearsome teeth? Again, down in Florida, did you ever go to Gatorland? Oh, dude, Gatorland, what do they do? They stick their head in the gator's mouth. It's crazy, man. So that can't be talking about that. This is where it gets really good. And I love when especially youth have never seen this before. It's snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. Its breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from its mouth. What are we talking about here? A dragon. There's no way either, either that's just allegorical or mythological or Job is literally describing something. Well, I'm just foolish enough to believe the word of God is literal. Unless it means it's trying to be poetic or something, it's literal. That's just how I read it. And listen, that's coming from a former devout militant atheist. But when I finally got saved and set free, I read the Bible for the first time with a child's eyes and I just read it literally. And I was like, no, this is talking. But that's crazy. There's also a talking donkey. There's somebody in here who didn't know that. And you're like, what? It's in there too. You should pick up your word. And Do you know my drug dealer? It's a long story, but my drug dealer, right before I got saved, you need to read the book of Revelation. I'm doing meth on his coffee table, and he's going, you need to read the book of Revelation. God was using my meth dealer to start to knock on my heart's door while I was doing meth on his coffee table. So you know what the first book of the Bible I read once I got saved? Revelation. Do you know what I was thinking? It's like, whoa, man, this thing's crazy. Like, I was like seven-headed dragons and all this stuff. And so then I asked my wife, I said, well, what do I do now? She goes, well, the New Testament starts with Matthew. Start there. And I was like, all right. And then I read the New Testament, and I read Matthew. And I realized who would save me because I, at this point I was still unsure. And I discovered grace and peace and mercy and forgiveness and repentance and I read the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I was like, this is it. This is the one who's changed my life forever. And <laughs> so I read Matthew, then I read Mark, then I read Luke, 
And then I went to my wife and I said, why do I keep reading the same story over and over again? I don't understand. I just read this story three times. Is this all the Bible does is tell the same? I didn't understand the nature of the four gospels because, see, I wasn't in church or, or seminary or anything. I just simply picked up the word and started to read it one day. And with a child's eyes, I didn't understand why I was reading the same story four times over again. Right? So then I went back to Genesis and I just started reading. Anyways, moving on. The sword that reaches it has no effect, nor does the spear, nor the dart, or the javelin. It's iron, it treats like straw, and bronze, it's like a rotted wood. Arrows do not make it flee. Sling stones are like chafe to it. A club seems, like, uh, seems to it, but a piece of straw, it laughs at the rattling lance. That's an amazing beast, whatever that thing is, man. I mean, that is an amazing beast. So what is a Leviathan exactly? I love Strong's Concordance. Anybody Strong's? Love it. I love going back to the original language. I hate the phone, but there is an app on your phone. It's Bible Hub, and Bible Hub is awesome because it gives you all of the translations like next to each other so you can compare. It gives you relative scriptures so you can look into further, but you can click on Strong's right there, and it takes you right to it. Strong's, the word Leviathan, 3882 is the number. Serpent, sea monster, or dragon. The other occurrence is tannin, serpent, dragon, or sea monster. That's the literal definition of what this animal is, Right? So the Bible absolutely talks about what I would consider some sort of massive serpent, fire-breathing, snort of flames and nostrils and smoke. I mean, it's, it blows my mind that that is in the Word of God. I didn't know that for the longest time. The first time I read that, when I, when I was reading it, Pastor, you know, cause I just started back at Genesis, and I was like, I don't know why I'm reading the same thing over and over again, and this book at the end here is crazy. Let me just start it back at Genesis. By the time I got to Job and started reading this, I was like, what is this thing talk? What? This is crazy. So here's the question. The Bible talks about it. Do we have dragon legends that match up to it? And I would say, yes, absolutely. So this is really cool. A missionary goes over to the Kukuyulanji tribe in Queensland, Australia, and they're in a jungle, okay? These people have never seen a textbook. They don't know what a museum is. They, they live by fire and water. That's, they're, they're arrow hunters, like these are, these are a people who have made a decision kind of like the Amish around here who it's like, I'm just not going to go the way you're going. I'm going to stay primitive. These people are as, as primitive as it gets. And they have this Yaru that they keep telling this missionary about. And this Yaru who came and attacked the village and ate one of their girls. And so finally the missionary said, can you draw me a picture of what Yaru looked like? And this is what they drew. And you can see around here that it's got the people who are trying to kill this, this beast. And you can see the girl in the beast's stomach. And Yaru's attacking it. Now, remember, they've never seen a textbook. They've never been to a museum. How is it that they got so close to what an actual plesiosaurus looks like? Is that just a great coincidence? Or could it be that they saw it? Because remember, it said, look at the behemoth that I made alongside of you. And I don't believe that 65 million years ago, something became extinct before humans evolved into who we are now. I believe humans and dinosaurs walked side by side. Not that long ago, really. And this is one evidence. What about this? This is... What about St. George and the Dragon, 1502? That's a well-known legendary story of, of St. George trying to rescue the princess and the dragon was trying to protect the, the, the princess, trying to, trying to harm her, and St. George was after it. Maybe that's not as legendary as what we think it is because we have dragon legends all over the place. Marco? All right. Did you know that he's more than just a pool game? He's actually a historian. And he traveled the world, and here's part of what he wrote down. Here are found snakes and huge serpents, 10 paces in length and 10 spans in girth. That is 50 feet long and 100. Would you like mess with that? <laughs> I would not. At the four part near the head, they have two short legs. Now, I need you to stuff that in your back pocket for about three minutes, okay? Take that near the forefront, because that's a weird detail. Near the head, they have two short legs. It's a very strange detail. Each with three claws as well as eyes larger than a loaf and very glaring. They're, now, start to remember Job's description. It's formidable. No one would approach it. Now read what he says. It's like he's reading from Job. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Others are smaller in size, being eight, six, and five paces long. Didn't that sound just like what Job had said? The same description Job gave about this beast with fearsome teeth, and you can't approach it. Now Marco Polo's documenting back in his travels. Man, I've run into these things that are huge. Now, so here's the thing. We've got legends that match that. Is there any evidence for the legends, though? Now, here's dinosaur figurines from Acambro, Mexico. This is 800 B.C. to 200 A.D., and I want you to take that back out of your back pocket now. What do you see? Up near the forefront, near the head, are two short legs. That's a strange, that's a strange kind of 
thing in a totally different part of the world, in a totally different time in history, you've got these Acambrio Mexican figurines that match the description of this serpent-looking thing that was sometimes 50 foot in length with two short legs up toward... Is that just a coincidence? Or could it be that they were seeing the same type of thing, even in a different part of the world at a different point in time? Here's another one from Acambrio, Mexico. This is, this is a, a, a dragon figurine that they have. This is long before museums and textbooks and paleontology and archaeology, long before any of the sciences, and now this is a modern drawing in a museum. Now look at the similarities between that and that. Now there's either two answers. Wow, that was a great guess. Wow. Or they saw it. There's not another option. Either they saw it or they just happened to stumble upon a great guess. This is a whole other region of the world going over to Cambodia, 700, 1200 A.D. Again, not that long ago and way before museums, science, textbooks, paleontology or anything. And you go there and there's these cool inscriptions that are found. And there's this tower of inscriptions that are found on some of the pillars. And when you focus in on this one right here, what is that? A stegosaurus. Now, here's the world's answer because you pesky Christian, you need it to fit your worldview. You're going to call it a pegasaurus. That's a, we're, we're back to the whole um, hippo thing. That's a hippo with a flower behind it. I don't know why hippos are so popular in explanations, but that's a hippo with a, now the problem with the hippo flower thing, all of these are different animals. None of them have any flora or fauna in there. Why is it that this one all of a sudden has a flower behind it when none of the other ones have it? Doesn't. That's a stegosaurus. We'll come back to the States over in Utah, 400 to 1300 A.D. This is uh, Natural Bridges and Monument. You're going to see there's this like human dude here. Here's his head, his shoulders, his legs. And then there's this thing. And when I blow that thing up, what is that? That's like a brontosaurus or an allosaurus. Now, the world's explanation is, is you little pesky Christian, you're so silly. This is a worm. And then erosion hit the belly area. And then the belly area, the water eroded down, making it look like it had legs. Well, why didn't it erode the neck or the head or the tail or anything? Why did it only erode here? Because I don't think that's erosion. I think that's the relief as it's found, and it's right next to the man, and it's a, it's a brontosaurus. And so we have evidence for that. So what about humans living at the same time? Because that's where I really want to get to on this. If, if, if my Bible is correct and Genesis is correct, the earth isn't more than six to 10,000 years old. And, and I, can, I have two different talks that are specifically designed for this, and I could spend two weeks talking about it. I love poking holes in the old earth theory. I love it. I'm such a geek about it. I traveled 197 river miles with answers in Genesis on the Grand Canyon, touching every single layer that went down, looking for any evidence within the Grand Canyon for old earth, and there's none there. There's millions of years of death, decay, and destruction missing between every single layer. You get down to the bottom, it's called the Great Unconformity. I'm actually coming back here in about three weeks. I'm going to a trip to the Wisconsin Dells, and we're going to, with, a, with the world's leading Steve Austin, Dr. Steve Austin, one of the world's leading geologists, and we're going to go do more research at the Wisconsin Dells because that's another place in the United States, one of the only places in the United States where you can go and see the Great Unconformity. Now, you guys need to go. You guys live here. i got to fly here. It's expensive. You guys live here. Drive over and see it for yourself. What it is is it's metamorphic rock, igneous rock, and it touches sedimentary rock. It's God's creation in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. That's creation rock. And the great unconformity means there should be millions and millions and millions of years, and then sedimentary rock is laid on top, and you can touch creation and judgment at the same time. It's humbling. It's humbling. And I can't wait to go do it again. I got to do it at the Grand Canyon, and I got to do it at... Um, at, uh, I'm going to get to do it again here in a few weeks over at the Wisconsin Dells. It's a really cool thing. And you know what's cool about it? You're going down through the Grand Canyon. I have a whole talk on this as well about fossil evidence in the Grand Canyon. There's seashell fossils in the Grand Canyon. You want to tell me how they got there? Last I knew, the Grand Canyon is nowhere near the ocean, but there's sea life. But anyways, you get down to the Great Unconformity, and all this animal fossils and reptile fossils and sea life fossils that you've been seeing all the way through, stop. You get to the great unconformity, there's no more fossils. Why? Because before the judgment, before when, when God created everything, he said it was good, it was very good. There was no death. There was no fossils back then. It was only after the judgment that we start to see fossils. So what about humans living with, with dinosaurs at the same time? This is from Nova TV, and their special was called God, Darwin, and the Dinosaurs, because they knew this. Dinosaur footprints side by side with humans finding them would counter evidence that humans evolved long after dinosaurs became extinct and back up the claim that all species, including man, were created at one time. They know that's the case. And so here's the thing. I'm going to play a short clip from this guy who 
had gone down to a place that I've been to. It's, it's in Glen Rose, Texas, Dinosaur Monument National Park. I've been there, <clears throat> been there several times because I had to go do some research myself because they go down. Remember I said I just want to know the truth? They don't want you to know the truth. And what you're going to hear this guy talk about is the fact that, hold on a second, I came here and there were human footprints, and then I came back 12 years later and they're gone. Where did they go? Listen to what he says. Twelve years have passed since the time that, that I'd been there with my buddies. And uh, we went, my wife and I, and went down there and we looked and looked and looked. Couldn't find any human footprints anywhere. So go back into the office or there, you know, the area where, you know, the rangers and all the people that work for the park were sitting behind their desks and stuff. And I'll go up to the counter and I said, you know, pardon me. And, you know, talking loud where everybody could hear me in there. I said, what happened to those uh, caveman tracks that y'all used to have out here? And they all looked at me and they didn't say anything. I said, what happened to the human footprints and the caveman tracks that you used to have here? And someone spoke up and said, we never had anything like that out here. I said, oh, yes, you did. Back in 1972, I saw them and my buddy saw them. No. We've never had anything. So I left, and we were in the parking lot, but there was an elderly gentleman that was in the inside, and I didn't notice him, but he followed me outside, and he stopped me in the parking lot, and he said, he said, you, those signs that you said you read, caveman tracks and the dinosaur names that were on those signs, he said, they're in that shed, they're in the woods, that shed, you see it? I said, yeah, I see it. He said, those signs are in that shed. And I asked him, said, how do you know? He said, I put them there. And I said, you put them there? He said, yes, I put them there. He said, I, I used to, to work to here why. back during that time that you're talking about. And yes, you're right. And you're telling the truth. And I asked him, I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, they took the signs out and they took the, the, the footprints. They took them out took them out and I said well then they were here so oh, yeah they were here and uh, I said well why did they take the human tracks away he said the reason is to this. it doesn't fit their textbooks he said you know this is a Texas funded state park and they don't believe that dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time they don't teach that and if they, if they don't remove the evidence, they're going to have to change all the textbooks. And they're not about to do that. If they don't remove the evidence, they're going to have to change the textbooks, and they're not willing to do that. Why? If the textbooks don't teach the truth, why not change it to fit the truth? And what they did was they, they went down there, and I, I've got a good friend. His name is Dr. Aaron Judkins. And he, is, he is a very good friend of mine. I've been down there several times with him. He, he wrote his doctrinal thesis for his Ph.D. work on the human footprint phenomena. It's not just in Glen Rose, Texas, that you find footprints alongside dinosaur, human footprints with dinosaur footprints. It's all around the world you find this. So that's why he wrote it on the global human footprint phenomena for his Ph.D. work. They went down because it didn't fit. Remember the timeline? He said in 1972 they were there. Remember that timeline I was giving you, the 60s, the 50s and the 60s, where all this stuff was, tri was, was changing? And, and the Scopes trial changed everything. Well, in the, in the early 70s, those footprints were obvious. They actually had them marked with yellow paint, and it said caveman footprints, caveman tracks, and then it said sauropod tracks over here, right? Well, and if you don't believe me, here's, this is a sign that Aaron, that sign's not there anymore. Aaron took a picture. They have signs all through Glen Rose Dinosaur Monument National Park with identifying different things. Well, here's, here's a sign that they made. Tee hee hee, this should slow them down a bit. And if you'll notice, the dinosaur is wearing human footprint, a human foot, right? And it says, some people mistakenly believe that human footprints are intermixed with the dinosaur tracks. Some of these human prints are deliberate fakes, while others are smudged dinosaur tracks vaguely resembling human footprints. This was a sign that's not there anymore. 
They put that sign up because they had to explain it somehow, and they're like, all right, let's try and make fun of this and put that on there. In the meantime, somebody goes down there in the middle of the night, takes a chipping hammer, and chips away the edges of all the footprints and says, you know what? These are too far gone. They're, they're eroded too far to be said. Well, how is it that you're going to have a chipped footprint here? Five feet away, you've got a sauropod track that's not chipped at all. This one's supposedly eroded. This one's not. Can water run over two surfaces, identical surfaces, five foot from one another, erode one and not the other? No, it's going to erode both of them at the same time. Why is this one all eroded and the other one's not? You can literally see, this is, this is a picture of my friend Aaron. He's down at the end of the track, and you can see these tracks that have been eroded. But I want to show you a couple of them close up. You can see a sauropod track with the three toes and the heel put coming down here. If you look right in the middle, see the big toe? There's a, little, there's a human footprint that's in the middle of that track, which is smart. Y'all have snow here. I grew up in Connecticut. We had snow. And when it snowed and you're trying to walk somewhere, what's the smartest path? Go in the footprint that's already been made. Otherwise, you're going to have to go. <coughs> Do you guys get that frozen layer of snow where it's like you walk on it and then it falls through and it takes you forever to get to where you're going? There's a walk through that one in Connecticut. Walk in the already treaded path. It's already smart. So we have that footprint there that's well known. This is the Delk footprint. This footprint was made before that one, and we know that because of the way that this footprint is. And then this footprint came and pushed the mud up into this track. Now, they had to have been made at the same time or at least close to the same time because once mud dries, this is limestone, once the limestone dries and turns into a rock, you can't go back unless you carve it. So they were like, oh, it's fake. It was carved into there. Okay, so the, the geeks over at Creation Gen uh, Evidence Museum put it into a CT scanner, and they wanted to see is there a compression rating because if it's carved, you're removing substance. So if it's carved, there's no compression. You would just have removed substance in the shape of a foot. This compression rating is exactly what you would see if it were compressed down into there. And so it's compressed mud. It's not carved mud whatsoever. So here's where the duck track came out of is this little place right up here. But this guy who's, this is Dr. Judkins right here. This is our first time down there. That's Kyle. That's Shannon. He's a ministry partner of mine years ago. Kyle was a friend of mine who just wanted to come along the trip because he had nothing better to do. Kyle was an old earth progressive creationist at the time. And man, he's like sitting here going, you got to be kidding me. Because we were seeing things like this all over the place. And I had to stick my foot down in there because see how it's chipped? All the toes are gone. They even kept the, the shape of the foot, basically, but they just chipped away at the entire thing. And so there's a guy named Joe Taylor who is a um, museum replica master. Like, he is sought after from the world because he makes replications of dinosaurs or, or Stegosaurus or any, it, whatever you need for your museum. He can make you a replica museum quality. He's highly sought after. So I, I had a radio show called What is Truth that I hosted for a couple of years. And while I was hosting this radio show, I had Joe on and I asked him about this because Joe is very familiar with the tracks down at the Paluxy Riverbed. And listen to what he says. And, and I apologize for my obnoxious laugh. We should have had a compressor on there but because Joe's talking and I start laughing and it's very obnoxious. Well, we're working on the mammoth side, on the mammoth side at Waco. <clears throat> and there was an engineer there, no, no schlepper. He was a guy in his 60s, retired. He's a, he's a smart guy. And uh, he was connected to uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the big museum there in Dallas, uh, one of the paleontologists there. And uh, he, I knew that Carl, he had been down to see Carl Ball, and I said, hey, you know, I, uh, I hear your old buddy there went down to Carl's Museum and to the tracks down there, and, uh, <clears throat> and he said that, uh, yeah, those tracks are, were made by aliens. <laughs> and I started to laugh. This engineer, who's no dummy, <clears throat> looks at me, and he says, so? <laughs> and I go, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, well, here's what the guy said. He was down there with Carl. He said, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, they're obviously humans. I mean, you can't say they're not. And the, and the Indians didn't carve them under, you know, the limestone. So, yeah. okay, they got to be real. Well, those are made by aliens <clears throat> uh, following the dinosaurs, taking photographs, and that's how someday we'll know what they look like. And I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, these advanced aliens... Uh, which don't have to walk in the mud. They can just beam out of their little window up there and get an uh, electron scan. Why do they have to have the Kodak out there walking around the mud with no, no shoes on? <laughs> they haven't invented tennis shoes yet. Nikes had not come around. <laughs> they're, they're, they're superior to us. They can go through space, you know, and they can't invent tennis shoes. They're still using Kodak. <laughs> now, these are, these are you're, serious you're cracking us up here in the studio, Joe. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's their uh, show coming. I you mean, know, I, I just looked at this guy and I thought, I, I can't believe my ears. Bless your heart. That's what I think. Um, 
If you think he's making that up about the aliens thing, Richard Dawkins, who's one of the leading atheists in the world, wrote a book called The God Delusion because he said, if you believe in God, you're delusional. When pressed against the corner in a movie called Intelligence uh, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, and it was Ben Stein, who has no horse in the race, trying to figure out why can't you teach intelligent design? And professor after professor after professor that he was interviewing were, were literally kicked out of their schools if they even dared mention intelligent design. They lost all their funding. Their, their, everything was pulled from them. All their grants were pulled. Like, it was a done deal if you dare mention it. So he's interviewing Richard Dawkins going, are you telling me there's no intelligence somewhere? And he goes, well, it's, it's a high probability that at some point in distant space that there is some sort of advanced civilization that came to the globe here and the, the world here and impregnated the planet with the necessary ingredients for life to form. It's called panspermia. I mentioned it in the last talk. That's how their theory is, is that aliens impregnated planet Earth. And so now they can't avoid the fact that there's bipedal footprints that are human in nature. Well, those are aliens coming down to observe the evolutionary process. Listen, Jesus died on the cross so you could be saved. That's such a simple message. Why is it that aliens impregnating planet Earth and coming down with no Nikes and all this, why is that so much more believable? Jesus paid for your sins by grace through faith alone. Aliens created everything you see. Why is this more? Be why? Because this has been too quiet. We need to be more boisterous in our enthusiasm because the scientific community is enthusiastic about selling a lie. Why is this one winning? When the simplicity of that is so easy to understand. You have a sin problem and Christ solved it. Believe with your mouth and confess with your heart. It, it's so simple, but yet this one's winning. So, you mean to tell me they were just here recently? I'm not going to tell you that. I, watch, I want you to watch secular scientists wrestle with something, and you tell me what they are saying, because there's a whole lot of bless your heart moments in what I'm about to show you. A lot of them. I mean, just the, I, I should entitle this, bless your heart, just the entire thing. And, and let me just tell you, you can't find, if you want this footage, reach out to me and I will, I will get it to you. I'll put it in Dropbox or something. This footage, non-existent. I got this footage like 15 years ago when this was more of a, a new thing. And 15 years later, this footage is gone. I, and the, way, the reason I know that is because a few months back, I was like, I need to update my talk with some higher quality images and, and, and stuff. I had that picture from Aaron that I wanted to put in there with the dino shoes. So I tried to find this footage again. I tried to find the, the documentary and buy the documentary somewhere. I even went to like eBay and stuff. Like somebody's got to have this document. It's gone. You can't find anything online whatsoever. So I'm going to play it for you. You ready? Take a deep breath in. Deep breath out. Here's clear science. At first, there appeared to be nothing out of the ordinary about this bone. But this bone turned out to be rather special. Because what she was looking at when she placed the slide under the microscope had never been seen before. Never been seen before. So, they're out on a dino dig, right? And they find this T-Rex bone. You can see how big it is. There's a guy laying next to it. And it's so big that in order to get it out of the site, excavate it, and take it back to the laboratory, a, a helicopter has to come in. It's the easiest way. The helicopter comes in. They tie it up. The helicopter lifts it up and carries it over to a truck that can't get out into the area. And then they place it on a flatbed, and then the flatbed will take it. Well, the bone was so big, the helicopter couldn't pick it up. So they had to systematically cut it in half, which is fine because most everything you see, not most, all of what you see in museums, those are all replicas of the original thing. All the original fossils are in the basement. You're looking at casts and forms of the original thing. So cutting it in half and then taking it, putting it back together and then making a mold of the whole thing was not a problem. So they cut it in half and some fragments fell off the bone. So Mary Schweitzer, who's one of the leading paleontologists and, and dinosaur experts, along with Dr. Jack, who, who is a leading dinosaur expert, she takes and does an experiment, and she's trying to dissolve it down, right, to, to get down to the minerals, right? So she puts it in minerals, and watch what happens. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. 
but the acid worked too fast and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left, but there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? What do you think it is? You can't have millions of year old fossil that has soft tissue. How is it going to be millions of years old and have any soft tissue left whatsoever? This is what it would look like if it had been modern. Well, maybe it's modern bone. You're the scientist. What is science? You test, repeat, observe. Test, repeat, observe. So they're going to test, repeat, and observe. This was impossible. <laughs> this bone was 68 million years old. Bless her so heart. you see this watch, and you watch. think, what? You I say, didn't you want say, to tell anybody. <laughs> you'd be ridiculed, yes. right? that make you mad? Mary Schweitzer should have had the opportunity to be like the cutting edge scientist to discover this. This should have been one of the greatest scientific discoveries of all time. She should have been able to be like, look at me, I found soft tissue. But instead she said, I didn't want to tell anyone. Remember I was saying, you can't even mention it or else you'll lose all your funding? She knew if she told anybody about this finding that she would be ridiculed and possibly lose her job. Why? Truth is the truth. But the truth, unfortunately, didn't fit their worldview. This is impossible. It was a part of a 68 million year old bone. Was it? Does your evidence tell you it's 68 million years old? Or does your a priori guesswork of grandma's perfect cake tell you it's 68 million years old? So we're going to keep moving. And so I, I said to my technician, okay, do it, do it again. again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that looked suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like, shocked. I mean, How could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones. Look at that. Blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science, that organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. I'm not saying it. They're, they're saying, I'm not, I'm just playing you the clip. They know the truth. They, they absolutely know the truth. You, you want to you wanna close this one out? It gets, it gets even, there's, there's a couple of more bless your heart moments. Mary, Jack, and their team published their B-Rex findings in a series of papers in the journal Science and were promptly attacked. Critics said their samples might have been contaminated or that the supposed blood vessels were actually something called biofilm, so a type science. of slime. Here's science, ready? But as Mary showed us, she's been able to replicate her findings. The These are pieces of an even older dinosaur, <laughs> a well-preserved 80 million year old <laughs> duckbill. When she dissolved it away in acid. Listen, listen. Let's put this under the scope here. Well, look, is that a blood vessel? This is a blood vessel. You see the branches right there? And look at all of them. And it's so consistent over and over and over again. We do this bone and it comes out and I get excited every time. I can't help it. I mean, 80 million years old. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> what is science? Test, repeat, test, repeat, test, repeat, observe, come up with your analysis. And she said, I keep doing it over and over and over again. We keep doing it and we keep coming up with the same results. Do you know that you can, you're, in about three months, it'll be finalized in Glen Rose, Texas. You can go to the Creation Evidence Museum, and Dr. Armitage is going to uh, take you out. You're going to dig in Dinosaur Monument National Park. You're going to find dinosaur bones, and then you're going to be able to take what you found in the dirt, take it over to the to this science lab that they put in the museum and you're going to be able to dissolve it and look at it under a microscope yourself and document your own soft tissue and blood cells and everything else so you can have your own research you can do this i think that's the cool i'm geeking out right now when i'm telling you this because i cannot wait to do this but dr armitage he was one of the ones at csun that was fired 
He, scientists fired after soft tissue. Found. Why would you fire somebody from what they found? Did he create the soft tissue? No. He just discovered the soft tissue, but he was fired. This is what it says. Upon examination, the horn, this is talking about a uh, triceratops horn. Under examination, the horn under a high-powered microscope back at CSUN, Dacus says Armitage, who's the guy leading that up, was fascinated to find soft tissue on the sample. A discovery, Bacchus said, stunned members of school's biology department and even some students because it indicates that dinosaurs roamed the earth only thousands of years in the past rather than going extinct 60 million years ago. That's the truth. They all know it. They're finding them everywhere. Everywhere you turn, they're finding soft tissue and blood cells and dinosaur fossils. Dinosaur fossils cannot contain soft tissue and blood cells if they're millions and millions and millions of years old. That's just a fact. That's, that's just a fact. They had to have been here. We have so much evidence to support that they were here, including where I started, which is what's your Bible that said, look at the behemoth that I made alongside of you. And now we have clear science to back that up. So here's my closing argument. Maybe this isn't too far-fetched. Okay, come on, that's a movie. That's totally far-fetched. Uh, but, but dinosaurs in the Bible, not far-fetched whatsoever. Backing up what Job said about them, not far-fetched whatsoever. And so when somebody comes up to me, and I'm telling you I get it a lot, because I, I, I hang out with non-believers a lot, I get the, <laughs> you believe in dinosaurs? Uh-huh. Well, then how can you be a Christian and believe in dinosaurs? And I'm like... Sit down at the table, let's talk. And man, we're going to be there for two hours and going to tell you all about it. Because in my worldview, dinosaurs in the Bible fit perfectly together. Amen? Any questions? Okay, Pastor. dinosaurs. Wasn't that fun? All right, so some of you caught the announcement at the beginning. Uh, we did live stream uh, both today, so if you want to go to the YouTube channel and maybe share that with some people, uh, both of these hours should be on there, and uh, that, that might be a helpful thing just, just to review. So thank you, Dave. Uh, we, we were blessed. All right. All right. Let's uh, conclude in prayer. Thank you, Father, for truth uh, it sets us free. It sanctifies us. Thank you for pointing us to Jesus today. And we'll ask that you'd help us to be more bold and to be uh, just trusting you to, to help us to be uh, confident in the faith that was once for all delivered to your saints. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.